I, I want to ask a question. Uh, do you think the walls with Bashir would have been different? Uh, how different would it have been if it shot instead of being animated? Or has anything to For me, I think it would have been very different in the way that it touched people and how it reached to people. Um, I always say that in the, it, one of the pleasure of doing animation is, uh, you know, there's a script. The script gives us indication of a character. But in a live shoot, the character is going to, you know, adapt to the actor, and the actor is going to adapt to the character. So in a live, sh a live shooting, you, you have something that is a mix of, but in animation, we create every part of that character. We design its soul. Mm. We design its spirit. We design its intent. We design everything. We have, we, we come to an empty vehicle and we fill in all the bits and parts and pieces of that vehicle and it becomes the voice of the film. And only animation allows you to do that because painting does a lot but doesn't speak. Animation goes beyond. Y you can fill that character with all the, 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 the needing points and it won't impact with the actor's soul or the actor's perception of it. It will be pure to its own. So going back to your question, I think that Uh, why animation communicates to people that much because everybody looking at that character or at what he was living can be within that character because it was it, it, it's an open vase there's an option for you to go inside that character because it is not something that is closed in um, and that, that's what for me Uh, uh, the, the greatest aspect of animation is that we can actually build all of the, those pieces. So the animator has the power. As when you made Bilal, did you have to do? So you decide this is the hero. He should do this, say that, look like this, etc. Did you have for some reason, I don't know, to make compromise against your vision of what? You Actually, we were a bit, uh, this is something I didn't say before, but since Bilal and all the characters are actual characters, we've hired a research team uh, from the university to actually research all the characters, all the props and the environment from all the movie, from 17 different references. And they actually captured all these references. And when it came to the characters, we did what we call quattro description. So we took a matrix of each character's facial description, physical description, uh, uh, tribe, and behavior or attitude. And we've hired two different forensic scientists, one from Turkey, one from Philippines. They don't know each other, and we actually sent to them these characters' descriptions to actually restructure and redraw those characters. When you're, you're, you mean Everything. the literal, so when they find like the a, a skeleton from 500 or 5,000 years ago and they're going to build what he might have looked like? Is this no, what you're talking? What are you not, talking? It's much easier than that. It's usually But you're in police stations, that. yeah, if someone describes a criminal, first thing they bring the forensic scientists and then they draw the description that Matches, the, matches the, characters. the characters. So this Good is what match. we did. We took it from actual references uh -huh. and gave it to two different forensic scientists so we know how accurate we would reach there. And the accuracy was almost 87%. You have those two images? We have those two images and all those characters that you see over there were actually structured, modeled, based on the forensic scientist's drawings of that actual description that we've built out. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes for the environment, the props, everything that took place 1400 years ago. I would definitely say I'm so lucky to have, I would say, crazy investors as, <laughs> as a producer. Seriously, because sometimes budget limits you yeah. from going that extra mile. Because like, okay, just throw an African hero. Why yeah, do you want to yeah, go yeah. through all yeah. these research, development, it costs a lot of money, but we were actually up to doing all these steps to reach the accuracy yeah. of that era uh, of history. Did you see among uh, the, your selections of animation coming from different countries, cinematographies, styles, or influences, uh, 
in the in the in the animation that you dealt with. And the second question <coughs> to come back to our question animation that inspires or delivers the message in the most uh, super, uh, intrusive way. Did you I know you you did something very experimental with Sensor, a software company that basically measured emotion. Emotions, people watching. So we were connected watching the films, strictly animation. I wonder if when they tested these people watching all these animations, they found out something that, wow, it goes higher than what we used to see when we test people that are looking at Batman or, I mean, uh, live movies. Or, sorry, different no. questions. Martin, who won the Sensum Award? I'm trying to remember who, which film won the Sansom Award. Egg, Eggman, no? Egg. Oh, Maniacs. 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 Okay, so basically, I'll start with the last question first. What Sansom was is an Irish company. Hi, Kesha. An Irish company which um, uh, created a biometric measurement device which measures emotion. So we decided that we were going to have the Sensum Award, which was essentially the award which would give the biggest, widest range uh, film, which would give the biggest, um, the widest range of emotion. So we had viewers measured, and then the biometric uh, number was then the indicator of that award. So that's what that was. Um, in terms of the winning film, it's quite odd. It was a kind of Hungarian film, spoofed, very well, as an American style drama, cop, good, good guy, bad guy drama. Um, so that won the award. So I, I'm, what, how can I describe it more than that? Like a, a very well done police series from the 70s, pretty much. Um, so, so we'll have to do more research with this sensor company right. to see if there's a... So we'll come back next year with answers about this. And your first question, which yes. was, if I see various styles... styles. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's interesting because I, we have to go beyond the sense of uh, what animation style, because I mean, we all have access to the same sources, almost. Not all countries at all times, but essentially we've all been exposed to... Um, media and we pretty much any 11 year old or 7 year old almost from any country has seen some of the same stuff or at least by the time you're 15 from any country around the world most likely you've seen the same type of programs and depending on your personal preference go towards one or the other um, but what I find interesting again with some countries that aren't even allowed to submit or to pass money through the internet and stuff like that um, it wasn't so much the style of animation, but it was rather the kind of story. Yeah. It was the kind of story that they were sharing um, and expressing. So I find that that was mostly more important than the actual style. I would, I think, add, I would add to that that um, you know, for the longest time, and, and still today, we believe that animation is for children. But what I see in it being proposed around the world, with now the uh, I am a filmmaker, uh, YouTube filmmakers, um, it, they, they use animation as a way to express themselves. They're not necessarily filmmakers, but the, the accessibility of the tools of animation now being so close to them in the social media, that uh, we are seeing a new form, a new art form which is, um, I want to say something to the world, I'm going to draw my message to the world. Um, so it's no longer, you know, shooting cats and <laughs> looking at... Uh, uh, the YouTube uh, has opened up a whole new era of filmmakers and of animation filmmakers um, and, and that do not address their message to children, but do address their message to that community, to the teenagers and adults uh, of the world, and, and use it. The, the YouTubers really use animation to a way to connect. It's, uh, it's using a lot what you do, but, they, but by that art form, they can not only hide behind, but push forward uh, a message. Yeah, that's great. I would like, at this time now, we're approaching to our conclusion. Do we have any questions or remarks, comments you'd like to share with our panelists? This gentleman. Yeah. So we agree with the idea of death, how it's abstract, but 
First encounter was Mufasa, right? Mufasa dying, right? Like to me that really got to me, right? Uh, but I couldn't, for I would never forget how it felt. And I was very angry and I felt I was Simba, right? Because I, w my, like we had a separated, like family, it was like, a, like it wasn't a full, right? So I felt how Simba was struggling by himself to figure out his role models. And through animation, I really found a lot of answers. So I really never forgot. Well, so I, I come from the Bambi generation, so obviously <laughs> I'm from another era altogether. But yet again, that was my argument talking to distributors. I said, I cried at Bambi. My mother cried at Bambi. Everybody cried at Bambi. And we're still alive. <laughs> and we actually made it through through our lives, even though we cried. So it was always the joke that I would say. But they said, yeah, but today, you know, we can't allow children to, to hurt. I'm sorry. They're going to need to fear. They're going to need to hurt. They're going to need to um, overcome those things. And, and film is a portion of that. Film is part of that process. It allows them, you know, we always say, why did the Grimm's book need it to exist? Because they, we need to fear. It's part of the development process. So when I'm told, you know, this is too scary, I'm saying, no, you're too chicken. <laughs> this is not too scary because this is a process we have to go through. And, and why animation allows it, it's because also you can watch it. Why? That's, that's the conclusion of this thing is animation is the most watched element uh, program children watch it a hundred times mm -hmm. put them a live action film they won't watch it a hundred times but put an animation film they will why because there's so many level again I'm talking of my container with everything we've put into the character all the levels we have managed to put as children and as adults, we are allowed now to watch it again and again and find all those layers that we put into an animated film. I'm sure that everyone who is a parent or grandparent, which is my case, when it comes to a loud situation with babies, let's say three, four, it's kind of, and they want your attention and you have something else to do, the cell phone with uh, uh, whatever penis or whatever cartoon uh, or a tablet will be very handy and that's what we're using and our granddaughter sees them a hundred times the same like a Peppa Pig, I don't know if, if anyone knows that, that's a very powerful tool. She will be quiet for a week, for an hour <laughs> and you find this on YouTube, it's all over the place, so type Peppa Pig, it's millions and millions of views and you say okay, be quiet. But that's why it's important to use animation to say real thing and, yes. and intelligent thing. Because they do watch it for a hundred times. And I will always say that I, I don't talk to kids, I talk to kids. In the sense that you cannot look down when you talk to kids. They're smarter than us. They see things we don't see. They are so perceptive and so, sensi so sensible to things that we are not just flies because our life everything flies they are all there so um, I always say uh, I've been producing uh, children's program and films for 35 years and every time there's a word the words got to be careful and meaningful because it'll stick it won't go away it'll stick into the kids mind did you have a, in, in your producers hat uh, <coughs> moments where you had the script and you thought, yeah, I can see this movie being successful, but I don't like the message. I don't like uh, the the idea uh, that he can bring to s few people. Did you yeah, have? I have a whole stack in my office, but they'll stay on paper. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Any? Yes. Yeah, just uh, coming back to uh, making movies that matter, films that matter. Is the, the sources for finance? Uh, my name is Cashel Morgan from Ireland. I'm an animator, filmmaker. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like, you know, the sources of finance for these films that aren't necessarily entertainment, they're about raising consciousness or they're about putting out a message out there for adults as well as children. Uh, where's the market for that? I mean, our studio's going to go, yeah, we don't know where to put this. We, you know, into theaters or where's it going to go? So, is there a change happening there somewhere? My experience, uh, all big studios will not take it 
because they're used to their own models. Where the dog dies at the beginning. Exactly. <laughs> That's not the model they're used to. Where there's, I mean, for our case, I mean, they said you don't have any talking animals in the movie. They're all characters. We're used to talking animals. You have to create talking animals, like making Glad White. So there is like a model, and they want you to follow. It's not easy, but I believe private investors, other organizations, nonprofit organizations that care about the message would support you. And now finishing Bilal and actually screening it in a couple of festivals, now we have co-production company from the US for our second movie. So I think the first step usually is the most difficult yeah. step yeah. until you prove you have a model that could win. I have, I have, to, Sorry. I have to say that the film, our film, was uh, is sold everywhere. I, there's a few uh, South Asian territories that are left because we don't have talking animals, uh, and the one that we have dies, so you know, we're, not, we're in bad shape there. But for the rest of the world, the film has been sold. As I say, it, it's a bit, you know, you have to carry your cross and, and go, and, uh, but uh, there's no territories left, and the film was only released this Christmas, so it's very, um, it's, you're, you're not gonna get, you gotta, you gotta give them everything though. You've got to bring the whole package to them because marketing-wise, as uh, Bruno was saying earlier, they have no idea how to market it. So my option was to say, okay, here is the marketing toolbox because you don't know how to treat, uh, talk about death. I'm going to help you. What did I do? I found Celine Dion. I asked her to sing the song about death. <laughs> so now they had a tool to market my film. I was lucky enough she said yes. Wow. It's one time in a lifetime. Yeah. But yet again, that was part of my marketing tool approach saying if somebody that relevant can talk about it then you should be relevant enough to market it you know i was kind of giving them the proof was in that pudding and and so they took it from there